everyone to the rest podcast where our goal is to help each and every one of you displace confusion chaos and dis-ease in order to heal and find significance in life i am your host natalie roberts and i am here with the author of the reconstitution method for healing and rest virginia dixon marie i am so happy that you are joining me for this podcast today because you are an absolute creative ninja you stop at nothing the projects that you've been involved in the things you've done who you are as a woman as a person the connections you have is just like no other and nearest and dearest to my heart is the fact that you're one of my kids oh thanks mom (laughs) but i wanted our listening audience to get to know you a little bit and what brought you to the hunted fox and this unbelievable inventory of textiles and textures and spaces that you create i want everybody to know who you are because you've graciously offered to do some wonderful things as well for the foundation and i just want everybody to know who you are so tell us your story oh hi my name is. <laughs> <laughs> so we do. We just start talking. And it, well, it's easy. You're my mom. So my name is Moana Dixon. And we, there's this funny thing. So a few people in my family go by two names. And there are rules to this. So for me, at least, if you know me with inside of my family network or from the time I was growing up, you have the right to call me Marie. But if we've met as an adult, you know me as Moana. And calling me Marie is just a huge privilege that most people <laughs> don't get. And so, but a lot of colorful things come with that privilege. Totally. But (laughs) that's the inside scoop. But if you call me Marie, it's really awkward if you call me Moana. And so you introduced me or addressed me as Marie, but that's because that's the name that you know me by and you have ultimate rights to that. Um, But the world knows me as Moana Dixon. And I have a company called The Hunted Fox, which is where we're sitting in downtown Los Angeles. I make really delicious things for the home, the places where our bodies rest, Mm -hmm. where we find safety and comfort. And you said something a minute ago, and I didn't connect the dots. Which I I gotta say, I'm surprised. Everything that you do is about the philosophy of rest. And everything that I do is about the physical action of rest. So everything that I make, texture and textile, and how it makes you feel, and how your body leans into it, is what I focus on. So the attention to those details and I use tapestries that are hand woven made by indigenous tribes, women and cultures where these stories are woven. They're literally pictographs woven into these vintage tapestries or these hand woven tapestries and traveled all over the world as you know, spent time doing color study in Oaxaca, learning how to, you know, take wool and turn it into a bunch of different colors and using, you know, limes and flowers and a bunch of other things but it's about heritage and they pass these practices down from generation to generation they aren't taught outside of their family environments and they take these skills and they weave these colors into the stories of their lives and these become fabrics that how did this become so important to you so people get a flavor okay you didn't you just didn't roll out of bed and come up with this no so home is is something that is on my hierarchy of values is my probably my top number one creature comforts and it's more than a creature comfort it to me is a foundation and a lot of that i think comes from just early life and feeling very destabilized by not having a foundation and rest for me was something that was always very evasive so my story that, yeah. is that we lived in between two very 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 different worlds parents divorced when you were very little Yeah, I mean, I think I was three months old or something like that, and you married Dad when I was three years old. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I was raising you two with Granny Pageant. How old was Dad? He was twenty six. He was a single father. Yeah, single father with two kids, three and five. That was great. Grandma helping him. Yeah. So you married Dad, and you became my mom, and the rest is history. I'm kidding. I was 22. (laughs) It's hard to believe. I'm 63. I was 22 when we got married. That is wild. Not only can I never, at 44, I can't wrap my brain around doing that now, taking on a three and a five-year-old in a very complex divorce dynamic and family dynamic. But at 22 years old, that seems like such 
I, I still stand in awe of that decision that you made. And not to mention that you made it, but that you showed up to it 1,500%. It wasn't like you Sometimes showed up like you... <laughs> 3000 percent <laughs> totally <laughs> but i yeah. but i would say you 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 leaned in you went all the way and then beyond in a way that i just don't i don't i don't know have i have I ever told you how much that just like how much i've observed i've really thought about your life from that perspective at 22 and what a challenge that must have been and it's easy to be a kid and be really critical of a person and then of course when you become an adult and you recognize how challenging that journey must have been and that I never, I, I just never would have made those same choices. I don't think I had the fortitude to do that. Well, it's shaped so much of my life's work, right? We do things because we love, and we love deeply, and woven into the tapestry of so much of my own story, I couldn't imagine not pouring my heart into you and Shai. We lived our lives, or Shai and I did, with one foot in two completely polarizing universes. And just, I think, going back and forth as kids also and in and out of different homes and all of the other dynamics that shaped those years of our lives. Yeah, every other weekend, right? It was just more than that. And as you know, there was just a lot of chaos and it was never, just wasn't a transition. Nothing was ever simple. And home was always changing, at least on one side of the coin. Well, the contrast was so great. Well, the contrast was great. But if you recall also, my mother just had a lot of different dynamics in her life that made her home life just change quite a bit and there were just different characters and different places and lots of things that made that just not feel like a very reliable environment if you will as often happens some of the early childhood developmental traumas that she had experienced were really triggered by your birth she's amazing another amazing by the way creative intuitive resourceful woman but that really destabilized the culture in the home yeah i think she had a lot of complex things to deal with and the reason i that those bear mentioning she's so open about it by Mm -hmm. the way always and she's got a lot of integrity in how she discusses those things she's very transparent about it one of the reasons i really respect her a lot but i think people listening to us today are in those homes are raising children in those homes, come from those homes, and don't have an anchor to displace the confusion, chaos, and dis-ease that they cannot escape. And so I think that yours is a story of triumph and an incredible resilient spirit, and you found artistic expression for all that. So that's why I wanted people to hear a little bit about your story. I think if I could surmise it a little bit better... I think that finding, even as a young woman when I moved out and I started working and I was going to school and working, creating a space of safety was always my most important. A nest. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a nest, and but even outside of the term nest, because I think sometimes that implies that it requires like all of the other things that most people would put in a nest, like eggs and all of the other things. Just bird alone still needs a place to rest. And um, even if there's nothing. Right. And I think that's even more important is that you can't put the eggs in anything if you don't have the nest, right? But creating that foundation as a stable environment for me to be able to perform outside of those walls and in my life has always been one of my greatest values. And I spent 18 years and a whole other career doing a world of other things. You were in the spirits business. First. I was in the wine and spirits industry for 18 years. Yeah, I built um, wine and spirits brands and brought them to a point of acquisition. And as you know, I spent my days in high heels and business meetings. Lots of men in suits. Beautiful purses, amazing shoes. I buy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just get real. Listen, it, it paid the bills. Yeah, it, it did. It did. But it also gave me the opportunity to travel. And I was paid to also become very educated about the nuances of these artisanal spirits and these products that we were producing. So a lot of what I did professionally was about learning and understanding the value of heritage and why these families made these products and what it meant to their culture and their surrounding communities. And while I was doing that, I was always looking around at all the other things in those environments 
And as life would ironically have it, one of those things that I always gravitated towards were these handwoven textiles that these tribeswomen in these villages would be making. And I'm speaking mostly of being in Mexico and Oaxaca and these areas where they're kind of the epicenter of these, you know, artisanal indigenous textiles that I use in my products now. And so I started what eventually. Con- what broke your back in that business and said, it would cause you to say no more to corporate America is what you really oh did. Oh gosh. Uh, it was more than corporate America. I think it was a cultural environment. And I'm going to try to figure out how to articulate here without getting caught up in the story. Because I've definitely told myself some stories about it and all the things that didn't edify me about the shape of my character and as it was being formed in these environments. But I had one very big moment when I was a senior executive and I was in a meeting with about 12 individuals and I was the only female in this room. And it was a difficult negotiation and one of the senior executives of this very, very large and very high profile company, our distributor, kind of made a joke and and my boss kind of threw me to the wolves in in a way that had some sort of a reference to, like a sexual reference. So I was the sacrificial lamb in this conversation. and What would be considered sexual harassment? and Yes, without getting into the details of it. But, and, it and it was so kind of veiled in light, but that was, the, that was the punt that kicked off the game. And you said, I don't have to put up with this. Well, no, I did put up with it. And not only did I put up with it, I was able to manage and negotiate and regain kind of authority and control and self-respect in the conversation and move things forward. And after I walked out of this meeting, I went directly to the bathroom and started sobbing. And I had one of my employees that worked for me, and he's only a few years younger than me, and he managed one of my key markets, and we were driving to our lunch location. He looked at me as I was driving and said, I don't know how you just did that. He said, if that was my wife, he said, number one, I would have killed every man in that room. He said, I'm amazed at how you navigated through that without making those guys look as stupid as they were behaving. He was complimenting me, but also there was an undertone of sadness that he had for me to have been in that position and also acknowledging that if that was his wife, he would demand basically that she quit her job or kill everybody in that room. It was just really offensive was the undertone. And I remember I I was trying to hold myself together because I had gone to the restroom and bawled my eyes out. And I looked at him and I just kind of couldn't maintain my composure. And I said, Corey, if you had any idea how hard that was for me and what that does to me. And I recognized that there was some part of myself that I had learned to fine tune. It was a sword that I had sharpened that should not have been in my back. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Totally. It was a straw that broke the camel's back in your world. You said, that's why I'm saying, I remember, and you're saying no more. That was the beginning of an end. I felt very compromised. And I think what, what bothered me the most is that I had been so many times in very compromising situations when I had senior, senior, senior executives having a dinner meeting that ironically was on the floor level of their hotel. And the invitation to join for a nightcap upstairs was often thrown around. I learned how to navigate through these things and how to, how to operate as a female boss and deal with all of these completely inappropriate things that happen all the time. I think what I'm trying to articulate is that there was no sense of pride in that, that when it really came down to it, I didn't like that that was something that I you're, became good at. Yeah, that and you're not a piece of meat. You have a soul. Of course. And yeah, of course, it's demeaning. It's not... But the blessing was it shook you up enough this time to say, I'm getting out. That was the fracture that when the earthquake came, just broke my universe in half. Mm -hmm. And the earthquake came a handful of months later when the founder of the company that I was working for was killed in a car accident. And overnight, it was like my, my own personal pandemic where just my world shut down and I had 24 employees underneath me and it was, I take no pay or a fraction at best of my pay in order for those people and myself to survive. And so I was still kind of working, but essentially sort of locked in my home, unable to do normal things because I was struggling to pay my bills. And I had a closet filled with textiles from all of my travels and 
I remember just feeling so frustrated by my home, by my environment, feeling so unstable and unsafe. And just, I I looked around my home, probably like most people did during the last handful of years when a global pandemic hit and they felt unhappy and unsatisfied with the universe that they had created. And sometimes that is the only thing we can change. And for me, I thought, okay, I have a sewing machine. I have all these fabrics and I can sew a square. And I made a bunch of pillows and my whole living room looked different in a snap. And then I thought, great, I'm going to sew some more for my bedroom. Now I had a whole new room. And my neighbor said, you should sell those on Etsy. And I said, what in the world is Etsy? And for those of you who don't know, it was the first online retail environment that was supporting handmade and artisanal products. And this is kind of, well, this is only seven or eight years ago. So the beginning of all of this. And uh, she said, let me help you take some pictures. And we took a few photographs and listed these things on Etsy. And about four days and a thousand dollars later, I thought, oh my gosh, this is what I have to do. Purpose in our pain. It's a great, it's a great story. It's the beauty in the ashes, the purpose in the pain, the meaning in what seems disastrous. That's what you do. It was kind of you interesting. Take pieces. Yeah. And, yeah. and make them into something beautiful. But you first had to do that with your life. You were in pieces at that point. You would had really endured a lot of things that no person should ever have to endure. I think you just nailed it. And to add to what you were saying is that in, in a moment when I felt very powerless and helpless and very confined by circumstances out of my control, the one place that I could actually find comfort in and create safety and rest for myself amidst the chaos was within my four walls. But I think that time when I started my company, I was in such discomfort. I felt so out of control and I needed to shift my internal environment. So I guess my my formula for spiritual bypassing at the time was to, to redo my home since I couldn't control or manage all the other things that were just, for me, it was chaos and my world was really shutting down. And then you were reached by Hollywood. Is <laughs> oh, gosh. No, you're Let's right. Leave oh, my gosh. Out. Don't even. Like, <laughs> I have tried to just cut this part out of my memory. <laughs> should, okay. Should so just... so to, to make, yeah. So what you do when you start a company with absolutely no money is you just show up places and you start selling your stuff. And I'm lucky enough to live in Los Angeles. And so There was this little artisan's market in Venice, which if you know anything about Venice Beach, it's kind of what it was always about. But this very cool guy was putting on a real kind of like artisan's market and it was 50 bucks and you just needed a table and a tent over your head. So I figured out how to buy a table and a tent and I enlisted You ducked it out. I knew, (laughs) including you, to heave and haul very heavy things. (laughs) to many, many, many grass fields where I built my business under a little tent in these Los Angeles marketplaces. And to your point, I immediately had celebrity clientele like Gina Rodriguez. She had a great show called Jane the Virgin. She's a beautiful Latina actress. And gosh, I I can't even go down the list of people that I started with. It was remarkable. But it was what I'm still traumatized by. (laughs) (laughs) That were the people that bought all your stuff. It was the work, the detail. It was painful to take those things down just because they were so beautiful. I couldn't believe we did all that work, spent all that money, and brought all those products there for two days. Your booth looked like it should be in a boutique hotel. Well, to be fair... The very, I'm traumatized the very last one I did, and I promised it was my last time. I, I did get into making my booths over the top, and I built a 10 by 10 foot, meaning I had a thatched roof and everything and a wood floor. And it looked like it was one of those little oceanfront kind of beach shopping little stalls in Tulum or somewhere in Mexico. No, it was ridiculous. Do you remember it my was words? Awesome. No more. <laughs> yes. This will never happen again. Marie? This I can never happen again. Do you understand me? You <laughs> cried and laughed. <laughs> it was. 
<laughs> it was brutal. But to be fair, it was such a stunning booth. It but was. it was so windy when I was setting it up and you weren't there. <laughs> the thing kept knocking, falling over. <laughs> and these poor guys kept coming over saying, is anybody here to help you? And I said, no. <laughs> I mean, it was like, you're right. It was too much, but it looked beautiful. And to your point, I said, you're right. I can't do this anymore. This is too much. And I have never, I've never set up shop at a market since, which is no, why you have not. you're sitting in my studio. And now I work with interior designers and every, people come to me here and make private appointments. And I have my stuff here and yep. it's, it's a lot and more dignified. you just finished a $5 million home. Oh, in nowhere, Cape. nowhere near five million. Oh, but it wasn't. Yeah, no, but you have to remember the translation of Four. of money. Money, it's oh, very okay. different. So it would be probably the equivalent of like another five million dollar house here. Well, it was remarkable. Thank you. You made the furniture. You made everything for that house and created well, an amazing space. I took a cottage and I got to play architect. And I completely designed every square inch of, and I built the and designed and built the entire house in cement. And then I created all the soft goods to go on top of that to create the juxtaposition between bones and skin. You built a refrigerator that was a room. I did. It's probably one of the most incredible things that I've ever built, and it's my favorite thing. It's a Amazing. walk-in refrigerator. Which I but don't, I just realized yeah. what you did with that cottage that you tore down, and you built it all from stone. It's kind of what you did with your life. Yeah. You well, decided after that corporate room encounter with those 12 men, you went in the bathroom, wept. You decided, uh-uh, no more. This is done. You'd managed to build walls inside that helped you cope and survive in a very, very compromised industry among a very compromised demographic. Mm, that was the you. last brick that fell. And I just want to say that while I'm very grateful for my career, mm-hmm. it taught me a lot. And... I know that my current company is also a stepping stone, but I would say that my career for me was a cornerstone. It really taught me a lot about business. And if I get to write my story and my version of the story, in spite of all of the complex things that did happen there, I'm really grateful. I'm grateful for the companies that like sent me across seas. And I mean, they really did invest a lot in me and I really took a lot from that. And that is, that 18 years is a cornerstone of everything that I'm building next. I think as is my company, The Hunted Fox, which I think was another cornerstone. But I don't think I'm anywhere near done. It was that boardroom experience that caused you to say no more and really change the trajectory of your entire life. I think by nature, people are so, we're so hard on ourselves. And if we could just relax a little bit and breathe and step into these deep places of rest, relational, emotional, and spiritual truth, we're able to hear the echoes of our soul. And one thing I love about your story specifically is how you were able to connect to that voice and create something absolutely transformative not just in your life, but in the lives of people whose homes you furnish. I often say that heritage is the womb of our hopes, our fears, our dreams, and our passion. Our heritage is a story that explains us. Thank you so much, Ray. Thanks, Mom. All right, everyone. For updates about rest and this podcast, please visit our Instagram or Facebook, The Place of Rest. If you'd like more information about Virginia or to support and join the cause of rest, please go to virginiadixon.com forward slash collaborate or call 949-289-5935. Thank you for listening to Rest with Virginia Dixon. We'll see you next week.